All right, what's going on, Pathway Church? I hope you're doing good. Welcome to tonight's Bible study. All right, I got Cross with me, and one of the reasons I do is because a few weeks back, we ordered a Titanic model, or a Lego Titanic model, and it wasn't real Legos, it was uh, kind of an off-brand, and they were about a third the size of normal Legos, and when we got it, we realized that this thing was about 1,860-some pieces. And we were so excited to get it started, weren't we, Cross? Yes. All right. We got that thing out, and then we started looking at the pieces. But we were still excited, and we worked on it for a couple days. But I'll be honest with you, that excitement kind of dwindled to the point where it's still not done. And I say that to say that it's very easy for all of us to start something with excitement, and even to probably start something out well but it's quite another, uh, quite another thing to see that through. In fact, the other night, Cross and I were talking, and he didn't want to go to karate. And do you remember what I told you? Lean up. Uh, any man can, can start can any man can start something, but a strong man has to finish it. That's right. And that's what we're going to look at in tonight's Bible study. Now, if you were with us last time, you remember that we talked about the rejection of. Samuel as the leader of Israel. Uh, Samuel kind of took this personally, but God reminded Samuel, look, it's me they're rejecting, not necessarily you. Um, and so Samuel uh, is in prayer asking God to give him guidance and to give him wisdom. And what we're going to look at is we're going to look at where God kind of leads Samuel and the anointing of the first king of Israel, Saul, starting with chapter 9. Now, Here's how the story goes. Um, Saul is a Benjamite. Uh, he loses uh, a few donkeys. And in doing that, he goes on a search. Uh, and as he is searching for his donkeys, he is led to the house of Samuel. And Samuel is told by the Lord that this will be the man that will be anointed, that will be called to be the king of Israel. In fact, if you look at chapter 9, verse 17, it says, When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, There he is, the man whom I have spoken to you. This one shall reign over my people. And so basically what happens after that is Samuel comes to Saul and he says, You, you're the one on whom all the desire of Israel rests. And that's in verse 20. Is it not on you and all your father's house? And here's how Saul answers. Saul's answer is very telling. Uh, because it shows, at least initially, Saul's a pretty humble guy. He says, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak to me like this? And so we see Saul's humility. We see his hesitation in being able to embrace this responsibility. This is a man who's not after power or influence. However, he is a man who, when you looked at him, he looked like a king. He was you know, head and shoulders above everybody else. He was handsome. He was rugged. He was a man who was very charismatic, and he was able to garner the attention of the people and unite them. So he was everything, at least physically, that you would want in a king. Now, soon after that, we find that Saul and Samuel share a meal. And in sharing that meal, there's a few ritual things that go along, but basically it's this, is that some of the sacred, uh, you know, sacrifices like the bread and the meat were actually intended for the priest, who are the anointed people that were supposed to stand between God and the people, were given to Saul as a sign that God had chosen him. Uh, Samuel then anoints Saul in private. Soon after that, Saul leaves to head home, and on the way, he runs into a school of prophets. And there, the Bible says that the Spirit of God, in some translations says, rushes upon him, and Saul prophesies with the prophets. And this was simply intended to show that Saul uh, had been anointed by God. This was evidence of God's choice on his life. Now, with that being said, we move on, and we see Saul's public anointing. Now, so what happens is the crowds gather. This is a pivotal moment in Israel's history. The crowds gather. People are excited. You know, they had asked for a king, and now the one God has chosen would be there with them. And so Samuel brings out the anointing oil, and you know what? They can't find Saul. This man, again, still hesitant, maybe still humbled by the prospect of embracing this job. 
is found amongst the luggage. They can't find him anywhere. They have to kind of pull him out of hiding, and they anoint him as king. Now, there's always, in, in, in situations like this, there's a period of time between someone may be anointed king and the time in which they are actually coronated as king. And what we see is that there is a period of time. And what happens is there is a nation, uh, the Ammonites, who come against a certain city in Israel called Jabesh Gilead. Now, they want to make a covenant. Uh, the, the people of Jabesh Gilead want to make a covenant with the Ammonites. And in doing that, um, basically to make a covenant means you is to cut a covenant. And, and basically what would happen is you would take some live animal and you would cut that animal in half. Uh, it would be a bloody mess, and you and the person you're making the covenant with would walk through the pieces of that animal and saying, look, here's the agreement we're going to make. I agree to do A, B, C, and D. You agree to do these things, and if neither, if one of us does not live up to this promise, to this covenant, we shall be like this animal. That was the intention. Well, the leader of uh, the Ammonites, he decides, well, here's the kind of covenant I want. I want you to take all of your men, cut out their right eye, and bring them to me. This guy is ruthless. Now, word gets back to Saul, and you see, again, Saul's love for his people. Uh, you see him uh, in his pride for his nation. Again, the ideal king here, right? You see Saul's response. I love it if you look in chapter 11, verse 6. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul, and when he heard the news, he was angry and greatly aroused. So he took the yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces, and he sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hands of the messengers. Whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on all the people, and they came out with one consent. So we see Saul's charisma. We see this man is able to garner the admiration, the attention of the people, and they go out. He, he, he rallies an army. They go out. They fight a magnificent battle and won a glorious victory, and Saul was coronated as the king. He is Israel's first king. And here we are with a man that looks, acts like a king, and he has started out well. He is humble. He understands the responsibility and the weight of the job, and he wins a wonderful victory on behalf of his people. And so it could not seem more obvious that this is God's man. But like I said, anybody can start a job. It takes something to finish one. So there's two things I kind of want to pull out of this story. First of all is I want us to be always reminded of God's sovereign involvement in our own lives. We see that Saul loses some donkeys, but this is not just an accident or happenstance. This is God guiding the steps of this man to the doorstep of the prophet Samuel where he will be anointed king, and the Lord will speak to Samuel about this man. And I, I tell you today, whether you realize it or not, God's hand is involved in your life. Not one thing that goes into your life is by accident. Everything is, he uses for your good and his glory Always be reminded of that. It's not if God is sovereign. The fact is God is sovereign. The question we need to ask ourselves is since God is sovereign. And, and I don't know about y'all, but I would have probably been very frustrated to lose my dog. Sometimes my dogs will get gone or whatever, and I, I get really frustrated. But you know what? There may be a purpose for that. God may have some reason for that. And in this case, we see probably a man very frustrated hunting the countryside for his lost donkeys finds out that God's hand was involved in it. No matter how little things seem, how insignificant they seem, remember God's hand is involved. Here's the second thing, and I think the more important thing for us practically. The second thing is this, is that Saul's life is a warning to us that it's not how you start out that matters, it's how you hold out and how you finish the good fight that really matters. In other words, the end of your life will reveal much more about your character and substance than the beginning. We know from records and we know from the remainder of this story that Saul's life does not end well. Uh, he gradually becomes more prideful. He gradually becomes uh, more obsessed with power and authority. This man would grow jealous of David after his victory over Goliath, and it would grow, he would grow so jealous it would make him 
it, it, it would drive him crazy. And the Bible would say he was mad and vexed by evil spirits. And he lived in misery for the latter part of his life as a result of that. And finally, his life would end tragically on the battlefield, not in some glorious victory, but in defeat as he falls on his own sword to kill himself. In addition to that, one of the things we need to know, again, is that it's not how we start. It's how we finish. And here we see a man that did not finish well. Take an evaluation of your own life. Remind yourself of what God has called you to do and make sure you see that through, through and by his spirit. Yes, during the journey, things will get difficult. During your, uh, you know, put, as you put forth effort to fulfill God's will for your life, it will not always be easy. Sometimes it'll be flat out boring and monotonous. Sometimes the weight will seem like it's too much to bear. Sometimes we will get lazy. But we need to stay in an attitude of humility and prayer and depend upon God. Now Saul's problem was pride. He had forgot to depend upon God. And because of that, he thought he could handle everything. And he refused to listen to those around him. And he refused to call upon the name of the Lord and to truly repent when he had messed up. And it led to his downfall. Listen, don't let pride, don't let laziness, don't let uh, the weight of the responsibility, don't let the boringness or the monotony keep you from finishing what you've started finishing and seeing through to the end God's call on your life. God bless you. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that it can instruct us, uh, that it can give us wisdom. Father, I thank you, Father, for the timeless truths and principles that it provides. And I pray, God, that you help each one of us to be able, uh, through and by the power of your spirit, through the dependence of your wisdom and and, and, and godly counselors, that we would be able to finish what we've started, that we would be able not just to initially embrace the call of God on our lives, but to see it through and to be able to say with Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. Father, I also pray specifically for those in our church that have been affected by COVID as we complete our fast today. God, it is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ that you hear our cry. Lord, I... My heart is heavy for those who have been impacted by this, especially in our church, but in our whole community, God. And, and throughout there, God, our, our state and nation, God, I'm begging you, Lord, to have mercy upon us, Lord, that you would touch, Lord, our people physically, that you would touch our community, Lord, uh, that you would be merciful to us. I pray more so, Lord, for spiritual renewal, that maybe this would just be a time in which we could shift our eyes uh, from everything that's going on around us here and now to the heavenlies and to that which is eternal. And I pray for spiritual renewal. I ask God that you would just scatter every enemy, rebuke every devour, devour, and establish yourself in our lives, in our churches, in our community, Lord, I pray. Help us as Christians to be wise. Help us to be faithful. And Lord, I pray most of all, God, that we would seek to God to 